Hello, my name is Van de Keizer. I'm a neuroradiologist at Ghent University Hospital in Belgium, and you are now watching a video on imaging of congenital malformations of the spinal cord. In this video, I will talk a little bit about terminology, talk very briefly about the embryology of the spinal cord, because you have to have some knowledge of spinal cord embryology to really understand this topic. And finally, and mostly, I'll talk about the imaging features of spinal dysrhythms on MRI. So let's start with some basic terminology. In this video, you'll be introduced to a lot of conditions with difficult but similar sounding names like meningocele, myelocele, lipomyelocele, lipomyelo, meningocele, and so on and so on. This can be a bit daunting at first, maybe a bit confusing and might scare you away, but please stay with me because I hope that by the end of this video, you will be able to distinguish these several entities and be able to recognize them on imaging. So several terms that are often used when talking about congenital uh, malformations of the spine or spinal dysrhythm, spina bifida and tethered cord, and they are often used interchangeably, despite the fact that they're not really the same and have different meanings. So let's uh, define these entities a bit better. What are spinal dysrhythms? Well, in theory, a spinal dysrhythm is any condition caused by defective closure of the neural tube, where the neural tube is the embryonic precursor of the spinal cord. In practice, the term is used to refer to any congenital spinal cord malformation, and that is also the way I am going to use it in this video. A distinction can be made between open and closed spinal dysrhythms. Open spinal dysrhythms are dysrhythms in which the neural contents are exposed to the environment, exposed to air, and not covered by skin. And closed spinal dysrhythms or dysrhythms in which the neural contents are covered by skin. A word that is often used as a synonym for spinal dysrhythm is spina bifida. That is not really correct, however, but it's common practice and will be difficult uh, to wipe out. But the spina bifida actually refers to a defective fusion of the bony neural arch. So it's not because you have a spina bifida or a defective fusion of the posterior elements of, let's say, a vertebra S1, the first sacral vertebra, that you will have a spinal cord malformation. So in daily radiological practice, I'm a bit careful when using the term spina bifida, especially for referring to these kinds of uh, findings which you will encounter relatively frequently on CTs or MRIs of the lumbar spine. These kind of posterior fusion defects are observed in the general population and about 10 to sometimes even 20% of uh, patients and they are generally an incidental finding in otherwise asymptomatic patients. That is to say, patients who have no symptoms that can be attributed to this finding. So be careful when describing those as spina, spina bifida occulta, as is often done, because it can create some confusion and misunderstanding. What is a tethered cord? Now, tethered cord is not a radiological diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis. It's a neurological syndrome in which patients have often progressive paresis or uh, progressive weakness or sensory disturbances of the lower legs and progressive lower or bladder dysfunction. What is the cause of this neurological syndrome? Well, it's basically stretching of the spinal cord. And why is that? because there is some kind of tissue attachment to the spinal cord, and this tissue attachment limits the movement of the spinal cord in the spinal canal. As children grow up, the spinal column grows faster than the spinal cord, but when the spinal cord is unable to move with the spinal column upwards, 
uh, then we get, because it is attached to something, then we get progressive stretching, and this might cause neural dysfunction and the clinical syndrome of tethered cord or tethered cord syndrome. A tethered cord syndrome is associated with most major types of spinal dysrhythm. Nevertheless, we often get the question on um, radiological request forms, tethered cord, question mark, how do we answer this question as a radiologist? Well, just be aware for starters that it's basically a neurological syndrome, not a radiological diagnosis. Um, and that is just a finding that can be seen in a variety of uh, congenital malformations. So this is a normal patient. And these are three patients who have completely different congenital malformations of the spine, but each time associated with a low-lying conus, which gave rise to the tethered cord syndrome in these respective patients. Now, when do you say that the conus is too low? Well, that has been defined by the International Society of Pediatric, Pediatric Neurosurgery, and they define a low-lying conus as a conus that is lying caudal or inferior to the mid-body level of the second lumbar vertebra. Then the conus should be considered abnormally low and therefore potentially tethered. So here we see the conus in a normal patient and the conus is, situ is situated above the mid-level of the second lumbar vertebra. So that is okay. If you would see a conus that is lying below the mid-level of the second lumbar vertebra, our job as radiologist is not yet done because then we have to look for a cause. It's not just about determining the position of the conus, it's also about figuring out why the conus is as low as it is and what is the cause of the tethered cord syndrome. I hope this is clear. Now I'm going to talk briefly about embryology of the spinal cord because there is no better way to understand these abnormalities than by having a notion of embryology. And we will start at the very beginning. Sperm meets ovum, fertilization, happiness. Cell division starts and after a while we get a berry-like cluster of cells called the morula followed by the blastocyst phase. In the blastocyst phase, we get, for the first time, some kind of cellular organization in the developing uh, embryo. We get an outer layer of cells, the trophoblasts, which are responsible for feeding the developing embryo. And we have an inner cluster of cells called the embryoblast. And the embryoblast is basically the group of cells that will eventually transform into, well, basically us. Um, so when it comes to the development of the spinal cord, three phases are very important, and those are gastrulation, primary neurulation, and secondary neurulation. When something goes wrong in any of these three phases, we can get well, a whole bunch of anomalies, but for us, it's also spinal cord anomalies. Let's start with gastrulation. What is gastrulation? Well, basically, gastrulation is the most important moment in our lives, in the lives of human beings, because that is the moment where our cells start organizing in the three layers that will develop in all organs of our bodies. So we start with a simple epiblast, so the inner cell mass, and in the epiblast, the streak develops, the primitive streak. In the phase of gastrulation, cells trickle down from the epiblast below the epiblast layer and will first replace these hypoblast cells and turn into the endoderm. And the endoderm is the cell layer that will transform in, let's say, um, or inner organs like the gastrointestinal system or the respiratory system. Then cells will trickle down to the middle layer between the upper layer and the endoderm, and these turn these uh, turn into the mesoderm, meso middle. Okay? The mesodermal cells 
or the precursor cells of the in-between things or organs. They will transform into stuff like our vascular system, a heart, connective tissue, bones, that kind of stuff. And finally, we have the upper layer, the ectoderm. And for us, that is the most important layer because the ectoderm will transform into skin and central nervous system. Uh, how does that happen? Well, it happens in the phase of primary nerulation. So we start with our three cell layers. We have endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And during the process of primary nerulation, we see the formation of some kind of cord-like structure in the mesoderm called the notochord. The notochord will induce transformation of the ectoderm in the neural plate. So this secretes some kind of um, signaling factors that induce this change. So cell transform, so cells of the ectoderm overlying the notochord transform in the neural plate. And then this neural plate starts folding in and we get a neural groove and it starts folding in even more until it detaches and the ectoderm closes over the neural tube. So here we have a detached and closed neural tube, and this neural tube will transform eventually in the central nervous system, being the brain and the spinal cord. What happens if something goes wrong? Well, a lot of spinal dysrhythms can be explained by a defect in the phase of primary nodulation. This is what we want to have. So we get a neural plate enfolding the formation of a neural groove. And eventually we want to see complete dis disjunction and ectodermal closure over the neural tube. Something that might happen is no disjunction occurs and the neural tube does not close, uh, does not close and stays attached to the ectoderm, or we get premature disjunction without closure of the neural tube. So there is premature disjunction, ectoderm closes, but there is no closure of the neural tube. Um, as I said, we will see various spinal dysrhythms that can be explained by one of these uh, wrongoings during the process of primary neurulation. The process of primary neurulation is followed by secondary neurulation. And secondary neurulation is the process that is responsible for the formation of the caudal most parts of the spinal cord and spinal canal. And those are the conus medullaris, the filum terminale, and the sacrum. How does that happen? Well, we start with a cluster of pluripotent uh, cells containing mesodermal cells, but also ectodermal cells, and which are called the caudal eminence. And the caudal eminence will undergo cavitation, central cavitation, and this will fuse with the neural tube that was formed during the process of primary neurulation. Then this undergoes a process of regression and differentiation, and it differentiate, differentiates into acet conus medullarum, filum terminale, and sacrum. So if something goes wrong in this process, the process of secondary neurulation, we will get anomalies, especially of the lower components of the spinal cord, the conus, filum terminale, and the bony structures of the sacrum, potentially. Okay, so that is what you need to know about embryology to understand spinal dysrhythms. Let's now finally jump into radiology. What are the imaging features of spinal dysrhythms? This is meant as an introduction to a complex team, so I will not discuss each and every possible malformation there is, because there are a lot of them. I will explain or talk about the most frequent ones and also, to be honest, those which are also easiest to understand. But maybe this will uh, trickle your curiosity or prickle your curiosity rather and uh, might induce you to study this subject further. So 
let's start with a classification of spinal dysrhythms. I already told you a distinction can be made between open and closed spinal dysrhythms, open neural contents exposed to air and closed not. And when it comes to closed spinal dysrhythms, a distinction can be made between dysrhythms that are associated with a subcutaneous mass and dysrhythms that are not associated with a subcutaneous mass. And the group of Spinal dysrhythms closed without a mass, a further distinction is made between simple dysrhythmic states and complex dysrhythmic states. Okay, so keep this in mind. This is a basic uh, categorization uh, scheme for spinal dysrhythms. And we're going to start with talking about open spinal dysrhythms, more specifically about the so called myelomeningocele and myelocele. So, this is a patient with a myelomeningo seal. And what do we see in this patient? Well, the abnormality is situated at the lower lumbar slash sacral level, uh, which is the place where most of these kind of uh, anomalies are situated. And what do we see here? We see a large bony defect. The posterior bony elements are lacking. And we see a large kist-like sac protruding beyond the skin level. We also see these string-like structures, which seem to be connected to the wall of the sac. What are we looking at here exactly? We are looking at a large dural line, or um, we are looking at a large sac filled with cerebrospinal fluid, in connection with the contents of the spinal canal, in which we see neural structures that are attached to the wall of the sac. And the attachment is called the placode, and the placode is basically non-neurulated uh, neural tissue, so basically the part of the neural tube that did not undergo the process of neurulation. What do we see if we look further in this patient? We see some slight herniation of the cerebral tonsils uh, through the foramen magnum, so a Chiari type 1 malformation. This is, as said, a myelomeningo seal. So we have a meningo seal containing a spinal cord or a neural contents, so myelomeningo seal. And this is basically the most frequent open spinal dysrhythm and constitutes about 89% of open spinal dysrhythms. How do you get a myelomeningo seal? Well, we get it by having no disjunction. And I don't think this needs any further explanation because you can easily understand why uh, no disjunction will lead to a posterior defect in the spinal canal and spinal cord. So what's the difference between a myelomeningocele and a myelocele? I haven't shown you a myelocele yet. Uh, these nice illustrations come from a nice review article in the American Journal of uh, Radiology. Uh, from 2010. Check it out uh, because although it's more than 10 years old, a little has changed when it comes to this subject. And in a myelomeningo seal, you see that there is protrusion of the sac filled with cerebral fluid beyond the skin level and the black coat uh, skin interface is located outside or above the level of the skin at this tissue. In a myelocele, the placode is situated at the skin level and is flush with the skin surface. So an example, this for instance is a patient with a myelocele. Here we see the skin. This here, do not mistake that for skin, this is basically just some clot or uh, some bandage which is uh, draped or let over the um, the things, the neural contents here, because otherwise they're exposed to air, but it isn't skin. And we see that skin is continuous with the placode. So it's basically one align and skin and, pla and the placode is flush with the skin surface. That's a myelocele. And once again, some colors to make it more clear for you. 
and this, and also for me, and this is the difference between a Milo Meningo seal and a Milo seal. And the Milo Meningo seal, we have a protrusion of the sac filled with uh, cerebral spinal fluid beyond the skin level, which is here, and the sac protrudes all the way here, and a Milo seal placoed and skin or flush with one another. And the same can be appreciated in the axial plane. We have here a Milo Meningo seal and here a Milo seal. Uh, this is another patient with a Milo Meningo seal. So we have um, here the placoed attached to the Meningo seal, which protrudes beyond skin level, slightly, but still protrudes beyond skin level. And we also see that at the level of the cranial cervical junction here, and also shown here on these T2 weighted images, we see that the cerebellar tonsils have a pick-like conformation and basically herniate deeply into the high cervical canal beyond the level of the foramen magnum. This is a Chiari malformation and basically all open spinal dysrhythms are associated with some degree of Chiari malformation. The theory is that because the developing fetus has an open spinal dysrhythm, there is some kind of chronic like or uh, chronic loss of cerebral spinal fluid causing some kind of let's call it a chronic liker hypotension syndrome in a fetus, which causes the, cere the cerebellar tonsils to herniate to, to the foramen magnum. And as a consequence, the posterior fossa or the bony covering of the posterior fossa cannot develop normally and we get a small posterior fossa. That is the theory. You just remember that if you are dealing with an open spinal dysrhythm, Always check the craniocervical transition area to see if the patient has a Chiari malformation, and normally he will have. So that's what you need to know about open spinal dysrhythms. Let's move on and talk about closed spinal dysrhythms. And let's start with those that are associated with a subcutaneous mass. We will discuss three, namely a lipomyloseal, a lipomeningomyloseal, and meningo seal. Those names sound similar, but when I'm done, normally you will be able to tell them apart. Let's start with this patient. So what do we see here? We have, once again, a bony defect in the posterior elements of the vertebral levels L4, uh, L4 and L5, I believe, and we see some herniation of neural contents, spinal cord, through this defect. But the contents are not exposed to the air. They are covered by skin. And we get, basically, if you look at it, skin here is elevated due to the presence of a lot of subcutaneous fat. We have a subcutaneous mass-like lesion consisting of fat as is indicated here by the arrows. And in that region of subcutaneous fat, we have a herniating spinal cord and a placoed lipoma interface. We have tethering of the cord, and this constellation is called a lipo, fatty, myelo, myelum, spinal cord, Meningo, so we have a kind of a meningo seal like sac, meningo seal, so lipomyelo meningo seal. And this is what it looks like on axial images. So we have here subcutaneous fat, and we can more appreciate that this has some kind of, um, that it is kind of mass like on the sagittal images, that is less clear on axial images. We have bony defect protrusion of uh, neural elements and uh, also kist-like outpouchings through the defect and a lipoma placoed interface that is located outside the level of the spinal canal. So what is the difference between a lipomyelomeningo seal and a lipomyelo seal? Well, it's very similar to the difference between a myelomeningo seal and a myelo seal. 
it is determined by the level of the black code. Here we have a placoat lipoma interface and a lipomyelocele, the placoat lipoma interface is situated at a level of the spinal canal. So it is not beyond the level of the spinal canal and a lipomyelomeningocele, the placoat lipoma interface is located beyond the border of the spinal canal. So I hope and this is uh, an example from uh, radiological, my radiological practice. The placoat lipoma interface is here, and it is way beyond the borders of the spinal canal, which should be here. So how to explain a lipomyelomeningocele or a lipomyelocele? What, what goes wrong embryologically? In this situation, we are probably dealing with premature disjunction, so the neural tube, well, it's not a neural tube yet, but uh, the neural groove or uh, it detaches prematurely from the rest of the ectoderm. And before it can close, so it's not closed yet, you might say maybe it can still close despite being detached, but these are all mesenchymal cells and they interpose between the ectoderm and the not closed or open neural tube. And these mesenchymal cells, I already told you, the mesenchymal cells or mesodermal cells, or cells that will transform in the uh, middle structures of the body, like uh, blood vessels, connective tissue, bones, but also fat. And these mesenchymal cells will transform into fatty cells. And that's how you get a lipomyelocele or a lipomyelomeningocele. Then another condition, an, uh, <clears throat> a closed spinal dysrophism associated with a subcutaneous mass is the so-called dorsal meningocele. What is a dorsal meningocele? Well, we have some kind of posterior bony defect, which is necessary to allow um, to allow herniation of a meningeal sac filled with cerebrospinal fluid, but this sac does not contain neural contents. So we don't find a placoat here. We don't find spinal cord in here. It's basically just a meningeal, a meningeal covered sac in the subcutaneous tissue filled with the cerebrospinal fluid, but nothing more. These are often associated with tethered cords because even though the because there's often traction and uh, attachment of the spinal cord to the borders of the sac, not within the sac, but to the borders. And in this case, there is also present of uh, intraspinal lipoma. And in this case, the spinal cord is attached and tethered to this lipoma and not really to the meningocele opening. So this is a case I got from my mentor, neuroradiological mentor, Professor Martin Wiesmann from the University Hospital Aachen in Germany. And in this patient, we see once again a large bony defect, this time in the cervical uh, spinal cord or cervical spinal canal, which is less frequent, uh, filled with cerebrospinal fluid, but not with neural contents. And one of the possible mechanisms for the development of these is that it's probably through to ballooning of meninges through the bony defect due to CSF pulsations. So as said, does not contain neural elements, but a but the spinal cord can be tethered at the neck of the meningocele. seal. Let's move on. So we now dealt with closed spinal dysrophisms with a subcutaneous mass. Now let's talk about closed spinal dysrophisms without a subcutaneous mass. We have two groups, simple dysrophisms and complex dysrophisms. We're going to start easy with the simple dysrophisms. Uh, and these include intradural lipoma, a lipoma of the film terminale, and a so-called ventriculus terminalis. Um, this is an example of an intradural lipoma. So we see a fatty lesion both on T2 and T1 weighted images. This mass-like lesion situated inside the dura is uh, hyperintense on T1 and T2, so it is fatty, and it causes some 
stuttering maybe or no. This is unclear on these images, so I can't really determine the level, but it's situated intradurally and seems to be attached to the spinal cord. So this is an intradural spinal lipoma in a patient who for the rest had no signs of other abnormalities of the spinal cord or bony elements. So these can be isolated findings. So what is another example of a simple dysrophism? It would be this. On these T2-weighted images, we see nothing out of the ordinary, but on these sagittal T1-weighted images, a T1 hyperintense linear structure appears. What is that? It's something that if you start looking for it, you might see a lot of times, but it's generally so small that uh, it's not uh, that good perceptible. This is a lipoma of the film terminale, an incidental finding on MRI studies of the spine that is often, often without further consequences and not associated with tethered cord or with other spinal dysrhythms. So a lipoma of the film terminale, and sometimes these can even be seen on CT-weighted images, like in this patient we have here, a fat-containing lesion located centrally within the lumbar spinal cord. And this was a film terminale lipoma in a patient who obviously underwent spinal surgery in the past. So another film terminale lipoma then is something the matter in this patient, these are sagittal T1 weighted images. Let's zoom in a little bit and we see a very faint structure located dorsally within the lumbar uh, spinal canal, which is better seen on these T axial T1 weighted images. So another very faint, uh, barely distinctable on the sagittal images, film terminale lipoma asymptomatic and as said, an incidental finding and up to 5% of the general population. Nevertheless, these can be symptomatic. Here we have another film terminale lipoma. You also see some thickening of the film terminale, even on the T2-weighted images in this patient. You can't really make out that it's fat, but you can see that on the T1-weighted images, the structure is uh, hyperintense on T1, and we see that the conus reaches to the level of the intervertebral disc L2, L3, which is basically a bit too low. So if this were a patient, arrows pointing to the film terminale lipoma, better seen on these magnified uh, sagittal T1-weighted images and here on the axial T1-weighted images, if you see that, and uh, the request is probably made because the patient had clinical symptoms uh, compatible with tethered cord syndrome. You have to say, but this is a low-lying conus. It might be borderline, but it's still a bit too low in a patient who also has an abnormality that can lead to tethering of the spinal cord. So this is relevant. Uh, then this finding is also something that is not so frequent as a film terminale lipoma, but sometimes seen a small cyst in the conus medullaris, and this is the so-called ventriculus terminalis. These are probably small cysts that are remainders of the phase of secondary neurulation. I told you that in the phase of secondary neurulation, the caudal eminence undergoes cystic cavitary changes and then fuses with the neural tube, and the ventriculus terminalis is probably some kind of embryological remnant of that phase. So it's generally without further consequences. If you see it in newborn children, it might regress later during development. Uh, and this is a scheme showing you ventriculus terminalis uh, drawing. So let's continue. We're almost done. We've talked about the simple dysrophisms. Now let's talk about the complex dysrophisms. These include dermal sinus, diastema tromaelia, and caudal agenesis. We're going to start with dermal sinus. Look at these T1 and T2 weighted images. Do you see anything out of the ordinary? At first glance, you might say, well, not really, is something the matter here. So let's magnify these images a bit more. And what do we see now? 
there is a small tract visible on both T1 and T2 weighted images, which extends from basically the skin, not just the subcutaneous tissue, we can also see it here, all the way to the spinal canal. We see here a very small and limited uh, bony defect in the posterior elements. And one slice lower, we can see a canal going all the way up to the spinal uh, Cord. This is a dermal, not a spinal cord, a spinal canal. This is a so-called dermal sinus. Now, what is a dermal sinus? Well, a dermal sinus is basically some kind of fistula aligned by epithelium, which runs from the skin to the spinal canal. And it's basically a connection between the outside world and the spinal canal. So these patients are at increased risk of developing meningitis and recurring uh, infections in, these, in this region. How do you explain embryologically a dermal sinus? Well, this is also a disorder of premature disjunction. And what happens here is that you get premature disjunction and you get a sort of ectodermal canal that is pulled in towards the prematurely disjuncted neural tube. And this will eventually transform into an uh, epithelium-aligned tract connecting the outside world with the spinal canal. So, and I used some colors to make it more clear. Um, these abnormalities are also often associated with, and with these I mean dermal sinus, often associated with dermoid and epidermoid cysts because these are congenital epidermal, uh, well, not strictly epidermal, but let's not get into that, inclusion cysts. So these can be seen as kind of cysts associated with the dermal sinus. Now, let's move on. Diastema tromyelia. What is diastema tromyelia? Well, basically, it's a split spinal cord. It's a split cord malformation. The spinal cord is longitudinally split into two, and the two halves of the spinal cord are divided by either a spur made up of bone or cartilagian, cartilane, uh, cartilaginous tissue, Okay, I hope that worked. Or either by a thin fibrous septum. So this is diastema tromyelia. Here we see a bony spur. And here we see uh, the two halves of the spinal cord. Uh, this abnormality is here seen on sagittal images. So we have here a structure which, ha which has a signal intensity similar to bone. That's not the only abnormality we see in this patient. We also see a cyst-like structure here above it in the spinal cord. So like a focal uh, hydromyelia or syrinx, there is a lot of... Uh, Confusion concerning the correct term, you know, syrinx, hydromyelia, syringohydromyelia, and so on. And I will not go into that. So let's just call it a cyst like structure in the spinal cord above it. Then we have here a bony spur dividing the two halves of the hemicord. And these are uh, sagittal and axial T1 weighted images. And as a further additional finding, we see. Uh, lipoma of the fidum terminale, which causes tethering of the spinal cord, and some arrows to make it more clear. How do you get a diastema tromyelia? Well, there are several theories, and it's not really clear, but one of those theories says, well, you have the process of gastrulation, and something goes wrong there. So diastema tromyelia is basically a gastrulation disorder, and what goes wrong, you get some kind of adhesion between ecto and endoderm. So normally, to induce the formation of the neural tube, you need an autocord. And an autocord develops centrally within the three-layered disc uh, of the embryo. But because there's an adhesion here between the ecto and endoderm, and this is the mesoderm, the, this adhesion causes you to have two notochords 
uh, which are located on both sides of the adhesion, and you will get the induction of a half of a neural plate on each side of the adhesion. So this is what happens. You get you have the adhesion, which develops into some kind of tract made up of endodermal and uh, mesodermal cells, and then you get a uh, half not a cord on each side of this tract, which induces the formation of a half neural tube or a hemi neural tube. So that's a theory. Uh, radiologically, we can make a distinction between two types of diastema tromaelia. We have a type one, in which we basically have two dural sacs, each containing half of the spinal cord and divided by a bony or a cartilaginous spur. These are usually symptomatic associated with tethered cord syndrome. And then we have type two, in which there is a single dural sac containing both hemicords, not divided by a spur. Uh, there might be a thin fibrous septum, but that's not always radiological, radiologically perceptible. And these patients are generally less symptomatic and might even be asymptomatic. So this is a clear case of a type 1 diastema tromaelia, and here we have a patient with a type 2. So on the sagittal T2-weighted images, you would say, well, nothing is wrong, or this looks normal, right? Especially compared to this patient here. But look closer, you have some thinning of the, or the appearance that the spinal cord is a bit thinned here. Why is that? Well, if you then look at the axial T2-weighted images, this is basically because here you have a very vocal diastema tromaelia. The spinal cord is longitudinally for a short distance divided in two halves. And if we examine the slices above and below this abnormality in this patient, we see that the spinal cord unites above and beyond the level of this type 2 diastema tromaelia. So it's only present over a very short distance. So the final uh, case of the day, I'm showing you an X-ray. We've seen nothing but MR images until now, and something is missing in this patient. And I don't know if you can see what that is, and maybe it will be more clear if I show you the sagittal T1 weighted images. It's the same patient. The images are very blurry, they're ugly, they're not so easy to appreciate, but the lumbar or the vertebral levels are already numbered, and you see that they stop at level uh, at the level of the third lumbar vertebra. So basically, the lower lumbar spine and sacrum is missing, completely not present. This is caudal agenesis. And this is an other example, dry D reconstructions of a CT, and here the CT images in an older patient in which we can see part of the first sacral vertebra, but the rest of the sacrum is missing. Um, there are two types of caudal, agen caudal agenesis. So caudal agenesis is presumably a disorder of secondary neurulation. So secondary neurulation is the phase in which the components of the lower uh, spinal cord and the lower spinal column develop. So stuff like conus medullaris, film terminale, and also the lower lumbar vertebra and sacrum, and also the coccyx. Um, and you have two types uh, that can be distinguished radiologically. And the distinction is made based on what the conus or the conal remnant looks like. In a type one, the conus medullaris has a very blunt ending and is high lying. So we have a high and blunt conus. And this is a patient with a type 2. In type 2, you have a low lying conus, which is tethered. So here in this patient, we see once again complete absence of the sacrum below the S1 level. So this is S1, and there is nothing seen underneath that, a complete absence. And then we have here an intradural lipoma, which tethers the spinal cord. So we have a low-lying tethered conus. And furthermore, there's also some dilatation of the central canal. And, uh, and you can call that a hydromyelia or a syringohydromyelia for all I care. Um, this is a topic for another discussion. 
anyways, some expansion of the central canal filled with fluid, a tethered cord, and caudal agenesis type 2, defined by a low conus tethered by a film terminale lipoma or an intradural lipoma. So, and that concludes all spinal dysrophisms. So we've seen open and closed spinal dysrophisms, and I'm not going to repeat this entire slide with you. We're just going to move on to the key messages. And for the key messages, I'm just going to quickly show you everything we've talked about, um, but at a glance. So we talked about open spinal dysrophisms and made a distinction dysrophisms in which neural contents are exposed to air. I made a distinction between myelomeningocele, in which the placoat is located above skin level, and myelocele, in which placoat is situated at skin level. And myelomeningoceles constitute 89% of all open spinal dysrophisms. Then we moved on to closed spinal dysrophisms with a subcutaneous mass. And if, the ma and if this mass, subcutaneous mass, is fatty, you're dealing with a lipomyelocele or lipomyelomeningocele. If it's a CSF collection not containing neural contents, you're dealing with a dorsal meningocele. Then we moved on to the simple and complex dysrhythmic states, closed spinal dysrhythms without subcutaneous mass, and we saw for the simple ones, the intradural lipoma, film terminal lipoma, which is a frequent asymptomatic finding uh, in, uh, or a frequent incidental finding in asymptomatic patients. And the same applies to the ventriculus terminalis. We saw a dermal sinus, which is associated with a risk of recurring infections and can be associated with ep epidermoid and dermoid cysts. And then... As uh, further complex dysrhythmic states, I've shown you diastema tromaelia with a type 1 in which two hemicords are divided by a midline spur and a type 2 in which no spur is present. And we saw caudal agenesis, complete absence of the lower components of the spine and spinal cord and made a distinction between type 1 with a high and blunt conus and type 2 in which the conus is low and tethered. So, want to know more? There's a very nice overview article published in Radiographics in 2001, which I stumbled upon recently called Practical Approach to Diagnosis of Spinal Dysrhythms. If you want to know more, because they, they also discuss a lot of dysrhythms that are more rare, uh, more difficult also, and that I didn't talk about in this short presentation, which is more meant as an introduction to the subject. Uh, so check out this article if you want to know more. And if you have any comments, questions, or feedback, leave a message or email me at neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. Thank you very much. And special thanks to my wonderful girlfriend, Glenda Verkouten. Thank you, babe. <laughs>